Well, that was a wonderful time. Thank you again. I'm Emerson Egrich, and uh, so honored to be here. Pastor Greg had dinner with him and with the First Lady Kelly. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful time meeting them, and uh, what a joy for me to be here. Again, Sarah sends her regrets. Uh, we have been married since 1973. She's in Paris, France with my daughter and her husband and our new granddaughter, Millie, uh, that we affectionately refer to as the Milster. <laughs> but uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. Have you ever received a gift that uh, you really wanted, but you didn't know if you were going to get? It was a gift of great value to you, and you were hoping you'd receive it, but you were uncertain if, in fact, you would. I mean, think back. You're 10 years of age. It's Christmas. You've been asking for a bicycle, and uh, you didn't know if you were going to get it or not. But then you're in the second floor bedroom and uh, Christmas morning, and you wake up at five. Can't get up for school, but we can get up, you know. We, it's Christmas! Remember that? And we jump out of bed, run across the bedroom floor, run down the hall, down the steps, into the living room where the Christmas tree is, and there's the bike, and you go, ah! Remember when you see, receive a gift of great value to you? It's kind of like that ah! moment, that breathless moment. Maybe you think back when he proposed to you, and he feigned, you know, this whole thing a little bit, and out comes this box and opens it up, and there's this diamond sparkling. <gasps> uh, when we first launched Love and Respect, uh, the chaplain of the Yankees, B.J. Weber, is a good buddy of mine from way back when, when we were in seminary together, and, and so we were doing men's night out in New York. I was going in and out of Manhattan, and, and I was with a group of men, and I said, hey, did any of you receive a gift of great value to you recently that you know, that you didn't expect. One guy in the back says, yeah, just this week, I received an unexpected bonus check, at, check for $100,000. I said, yeah, that, that, that gets at the idea. <laughs> I said, uh, as a pastor, if the deacons met to give me a gift of $100,000, kind of like Sanford and Son, it'd be the big one. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of a great way to get rid of a pastor. <laughs> but I want you to hang on to that gift illustration I just gave. I'm going to circle back around to it, but my next point isn't going to have anything to do with it. Just hang on to the gift idea of great value. Have you ever had a conflict with your spouse when suddenly the issue didn't seem to be the issue? And you see their spirit deflate, and you go, what? What? What did I say? <laughs> what? What now? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. What? My question is, what is the issue when the issue isn't the issue? Because certainly whatever it is we're talking about, as we say, is real, but it's not at that moment seemingly the, the root. It seems like something else is bothering them. I mean, we could have been talking about money management, and, uh, you know, but at a certain point, it seems like something deeper is going on. And I'm going to propose to you that it is. In fact, uh, I'm going to share with you, I believe I know what the issue is when the issue isn't the issue. In fact, it's just one thing. Now, of course, that's a very simplistic statement, so I'm not asking you to buy into it, because obviously only a simpleton would make that kind of a propositional statement. So push back if you want, see if I can persuade you. So I'm not asking you to buy into it, but that's going to be my motif. I believe there's one thing going on in the spirit of your spouse. But I need to qualify it right up front. One thing in him and one thing in her, and they're not the same. And this is why we have a tendency to dismiss them as childish, because the reason they deflate, we tend not to deflate over that reason. It just doesn't bother us, therefore it shouldn't bother them. But not only are they deflating over it and upset with us as though somehow we're the cause of it, they're actually offended by it and holding us responsible for this, and it's in disbelief. I mean, we can't believe it. We see them as childish. They shouldn't be reacting this way, but they hold us responsible for what we perceive to be their childish reaction. We want to say, grow up. <laughs> now, apparently, not too many of you have ever had that experience here. <laughs> but Sarah and I, since 1973, have had these heated fellowship moments quite often. <laughs> and it happens to all of us, good-willed people, not evil-willed people, good-hearted people. Because the, the deal is, the things that bother Sarah just don't sometimes bother me. Sometimes we have crossover, we're human beings, and so there are going to be some real uh, similarities. 
But that's not where we get into difficulty because we tend to empathize with each other at that moment. Where it becomes interesting is when she deflates over things that I think, oh, no, now what did I say? And she sees me deflate, oh, pff, that profile in narcissism is fitting you pretty accurately at this point. This is where it becomes interesting. So the, the question is, what is that one thing in him and one thing in her? Well, we'll come back to that in just a second, but let me illustrate it. When Sarah and I were first married back in 1973, 74, we were in Chicago, Illinois, going to school, and my parents lived in Peoria, Illinois, which is three and a half hours south. We decided to visit. It was during the summertime. We go down there, and at that time, I wore contact lens, and that night when I was going to go to bed, I realized I hadn't brought my contact lens case, and so, oh, brother, good grief. So I improvised. I went in the kitchen, got two juice glasses, came in the bathroom, filled them with water, and took the one contact out, put it in the glass, put the other one in the other glass, and set them on the back of the toilet and went to bed. And uh, then got up in the morning and, um, uh, you know, poured out that one and put it in, poured out the other, and there's no contact. It is gone. I can't, it's nowhere. I look everywhere. I finally go out. Sarah's talking to my mom and dad, and I said, Sarah, did you, did you use one of the juice glasses in the bathroom last night? No. <gasps> Yes, now I remember I got up in the middle of the night and took a pill. She drank my contact. <laughs> and then my dad suggested how we could retrieve it. <laughs> well, I couldn't believe it. I said, Sarah, I can't believe you drank my contact. We started this heated fellowship, starting to get triggered here. I can't believe you drank a like, juice glass. Well, I can't believe that you'd, you'd, you'd put your contact in a juice glass in the back of a toilet. I said, well, I can't believe you'd drink out of a juice glass in the back of a toilet. <laughs> and at a certain point in this exchange, Sarah's spirit deflated. I'm a newlywed, and I could tell that the issue was no longer about the contact lens. As important as that was, it was a real issue. It was no longer the root issue. We had two issues. I knew enough at that point that something else was now really deeply troubling her far beyond the contact lens that she swallowed. And what is that issue when the issue isn't the issue? She was processing it in a certain way on the basis of one word. A fast forward, uh, Christmas time, and uh, we again come from Chicago down to Pure Illinois. Uh, Sarah was raised on the farm in Indiana. Her dad farmed 3,000 acres of corn, huge operation. Uh, she uh, was part of that whole 4-H movement, that whole farm culture. She can do it all. She was actually Miss Congeniality of Boone County. And uh, so she's just, you know, well, she made me a jean jacket for Christmas. I didn't know it. She'd done underfoot. Uh, and so that moment came, Christmas presents, everything had been open other than that best present that you keep for last. And she hands me the present, and I open it up. Jean jacket. Thank you. And I put it on. And uh, she says, you don't like it. No, I do like it. She said, you don't like it. No, I do, I do like it. You don't like it. Sarah, I like the jean jacket. Why are you saying I don't like it? Because in our family, when we like something, we go, thank you, 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 thank you. In our family, we say thank you. We both remember my spirit deflated at that point. For the next couple hours, I was moody. <laughs> Bipolar, of course. <laughs> Mood swings. Or could it be that there was something else going on in my spirit as a male that Sarah's not tracking with? Just not tracking with. I mean, what is the issue in Sarah? when we're addressing that issue of the contact lens she swallowed. What was it going on inside of me when Sarah said I wasn't thankful for, you know, the jean jacket? Or, you know, let's just take your relationship. Suppose your wife comes to you, it's January 15th. I can't believe it. I put on 15 pounds from all the Thanksgiving meals, all the Christmas parties, the New Year's celebrations. I feel fat. I feel ugly. I have nothing to wear. Well, he listens. He goes to the Christian bookstore the next day, and the lead book is Dieting for Today's Christian Woman. <laughs> it's written by a woman. What's your problem? I mean, <laughs> he buys this book. He brings it home. He hands it to her. And for a brief moment, he thinks he's at Cape Canaveral. 
she goes ballistic. <laughs> and on the way up, she screams to her pink megaphone, you men have two brains, two brains, one's lost and the other's out looking for it. <laughs> she calls him a brainless idiot. Why? Because at a certain point, it wasn't about the diet book. She's deflating because something else. She hears a message in the diet book that she thinks he's sending to her. And it's not about weight loss. And what's intriguing here is if, she, let's suppose he's got a 40 pound spread on the front, 40 pound spread on the back. He's been eating, you know, like a football player for the last 20 years and he's been off the gridiron. He's a big boy. And so she brings home a diet book for him. What's his response? Hey, thanks. What's for dinner? Or her best girlfriend comes over with that diet book. Here, I got you this diet book. Oh, you're so sweet. Hey, should we do this again together? I mean, let's... Whoa. Why didn't she go ballistic? Because she hears a message she thinks her husband's sending to her that she doesn't think her BFF is sending to her. And I will say that body image issues are, are hugely different. I mean, they'll have a, a woman who's a perfect model, perfect 10. When she looks at herself in a four-length mirror, she sees all of her flaws, moves into self-deprecation. This is a proven entity, the research on self-image issues, body image issues. Uh, this 40-pound spread front and back guy, he sees himself in a four-length mirror. What's he see? Atlas. <laughs> he can bring Atlas out anytime he wants. He just doesn't want to right now, okay? <laughs> but he knows there's a six-pack in there. It's true. Now, are there men who primp and do that kind of stuff, and are there women indifferent to appearance? Yes, think bell curve, my academic background. There's exceptions to everything, and some people will, as I've said before, they, they work hard at being the exception. They don't like generalizations because they've been conditioned through academia. And so, but the point is, if something is statistically significant, then it becomes a pattern that's somewhat predictable to help us understand the human heart rather than pigeonholing and stereotyping people. But you have to decide how you're going to do with statistically significant findings. Some people don't care about statistically significant findings. One exception invalidates the rule to them. That's the way they live. So I'm not here for that person. I'm here for the rest of us who want mutual understanding in our relationships. Why does your wife deflate when you buy her a diet book? because she hears a message that you don't hear when she gives you a diet book, and she hears a message that you're not intending to send. You could be a health nut. You're just into good health. You're, you, you just, you're, you're oblivious to this. Fast forward six weeks, uh, she's now in that, that Christian bookstore, and the lead book is The Key to Marital Bliss, Communication. So, she purchases this marriage book. This is the third marriage book she's purchased for the two of you to read in the last 12 months. And she comes home, and she devours it from cover to cover. She says, wow, he needs to read this. But he's, been, he's got that second job. He doesn't have time to read it from cover to cover. So I'm going to highlight in yellow some of the key <laughs> sections for him to read. And then she sets it on this stand next to his recliner when he's watching the sports center. And so he comes in, oh, no, oh, another marriage book, oh, oh, the first two marriage books we read together, we got a huge fight. If I say anything about this marriage, I get in trouble. But I have this feeling that if I don't say anything, I'm going to get in less trouble. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to say anything this time, I'm going to ignore it, I'm just going to ignore it. I just, no, oh, good grief, I don't know why the publishers just don't publish these in yellow. <laughs> Unbelievable. So what's going on? He hears a message. He hears a message. It's not just about the marriage book. It's deeper than that. There's a message that he hears. And what's interesting, if he came home with a third marriage book and gave it to you, that's bragging rights among your girlfriends. He bought a marriage book, third one. I did not tell him to. I didn't even hint. Why? We're connecting. We're soulmates. See, this, this is, you're, you're, this is a, a reason for envy. This is fascinating stuff if you stop and think. What's going on with this? Are there exceptions to it? Yes. But usually the man who buys that third marriage book is because they're in crisis. And she said, I'm not, I'm not all in on this relationship anymore. 
And so that we have to be honest about what we're talking about here. Two goodwill people who, you know, basically are devoted to each other, but there is this tension. <laughs> Suddenly the spirit of that person deflates. It's like you're standing on their air hose and they can't breathe. So what is the issue going on in Sarah? What was the issue going on in me? What was the issue going on with the diet book? What was the issue going on with the third marriage book? The University of Washington studied 2,000 couples for 20 years, and they said, we now know the two key ingredients for successful marriages. In fact, the book was written, Why Marriages Succeed or Fail. This was an in-depth evaluation. They had linguists, they had videotaping, they had clinical psychologists, social workers. I mean, they had the works watching these couples in these uh, love laboratories, they stay there. And after a while, people let down their hair. Even though they're being watched, they had monitored for beats per minute of hearts. You know, I mean, it's just, they were, you know, talk about, you know, in depth. They wanted to know physiologically what the reactions were, what's going on with the word choice, what, what's, what are the patterns here? You studied 2,000 couples for 20 years, and that's why they said, we now know why marriages succeed or fail. And they said, it's love and respect. Love and respect. When those marriages that succeeded were observed, their conversations were carried along with a tone of love and respect for each other. And when that tone of love and respect wasn't there, when there was the sense of hostility or contempt, that was the killer. And what happens is people think if we didn't have the money problems, the sex problems, the in-law problems, all these different issues, we'd have a great marriage. No. It's the attitude that you bring to your spouse's spirit when you're addressing those stressors. If you come across in such a way that feels hostile and contemptuous to the spirit of your spouse while you're addressing those issues, you think they're not teachable. When they're shutting down because there's something else that they're extremely vulnerable to, just as you are. It's not what is being said. Very rarely in, among goodwill people is the what the problem. It's the how we deliver the what that is the problem. And we don't see it because we assume they know why we're bringing this up. Or they should, or they should give us a lot of slack. The reason I am the way I am is because of this issue. The reason they are the way they are is because they got a rotten disposition. Bias research has pointed that out. We favor ourselves again and again and again. But what was fascinating is that there is a gender specificity to this. Women tended to lean toward the love side, and men lean toward the respect side. Now, it's very important that you hear me. We all need love and respect equally. It is a true need that we all need equally. I want you to answer this yes or no. We all need love and respect equally. Yes? Now, but the felt need differs. In fact, as I pointed out today, we've asked 7,000 people this question. When you're in a conflict with your spouse, do you feel unloved at that moment or disrespected? 83% of the men say they feel disrespected. Very few men ever feel unloved. Isn't that fascinating? Now, you could say that men are narcissistic because of that, because that's how the pink culture interprets that. Women are telling us what men feel. But I'm going to tell you what most men feel. And it's not because of their ego. It's because they're assured of your love, but they don't think you like who they are. And they don't have a problem with you, they think you have a problem with them. They know you're a good, loving, nurturing, caring individual. So in conflict, when you're coming at him, he feels this is about you somehow pointing out to him that he's inadequate and you don't respect who he is as a human being. That's how he's filtering it. He's not egotistical, he's fearful. But men don't break down and cry. They get angry, they go quiet. And that is interpreted as arrogant and controlling rather than as a vulnerability. And so what we do is we don't correctly interpret what's going on. And we need to reframe the deeper spirit of the person and will help us as we proceed tonight, hopefully in being able to do that. But the women lean toward the love side. 72% of the women feel in love. And, and so this is a huge, huge difference in terms of how we filter it. Now, on the outsides, there are men who feel in love. There are women who feel disrespected. And what I always say is the best way to love a respected woman is continue to meet her deepest need to be loved for who she is. And as we've said, no movie ends with a hero embracing the damsel saying, I want to respect you the rest of my life. And that there's no card in the card industry from a husband on the 10th anniversary saying, baby, I really respect you. So though women need R-E-S-P-E-C-T, when it comes to intimacy and in the relationship with this man, though they want respect and will say they need respect, at the end of the day, it's love. Because if he keeps showing her disrespect, she'll say, how can you say you love me? 
and treat me disrespectfully. Whereas most men are assured of a woman's love. And so in the conflict, you know, he will say, you're disrespecting me. If you show him disrespect week after week, nobody disrespects me like you. Everybody respects me but you. But he never lands on the idea that you don't love me. How can you say you love me and treat me? He, there's, men can, I know clearly you love me, but you don't respect me. And, and people who think that these are synonymous, they're not. You respect your boss. You don't love your boss. You love deeply your rebellious 16-year-old boy, but you're not feeling any respect for him right now. These are not synonymous. And so the important thing is to understand that there is a difference which has to be understood in order for us to rightly interpret, why is my spouse deflating right now? Well, your spouse is deflating in most cases, like your, your wife, she's feeling unloved at this moment. And we'll explain that. I'll give you that right up front. And that's why she's deflating. But we're not trying to be unloving. And we, sh we feel that she shouldn't feel unloved. And he deflates because he's feeling disrespected, but you're not trying to be disrespectful. You may be reacting that way, but it's because you want him to awaken to your deeper cry of your heart that you're feeling insecure and unloved at this moment, and he should get it and also know that you really don't mean it, because you don't. So what happens, though, is he's filtering it still through that grid because nobody talks to him this way. So it's very difficult as a man. I would die for you. You know, I, I'm trying to give everything. I, and somehow, it seems to me you're using this topic as another opportunity to send me a message that you can't stand who I am that you have disdain in your heart for who I am as a person. Particularly because women do create lists, the negative list. It moves from that positive, looking up, that glow, to six things about him that you really don't like. And I get thousands of emails, and women always say, these six things, and she's trying to help me understand women are not mean-spirited. They're really trying to work on the relationship. She'll state the four to six things, and she said, but I'm not perfect. I have my issues. I'm trying to... And then she goes back, but I don't... So I'll say, hey, make a list of 15 things about him that are positive and send that to me. And she'll write back, and I've had this so many times now, it's just I can be assured this is the way. Thank you for having me do that. I fell in love with my husband all over again. Very fascinating to me. Just saw that again and again and again and again. Didn't mean that the six things that she didn't like changed, but sometimes we lose perspective. And your husband's picking up on that. He feels it's unfair. I know I got issues, but... I mean, do we have to go global with how horrible I am? But see, you're not trying to do that. And so he doesn't understand you, you don't understand him, and so you got two goodwill people who care deeply for each other, but get to this point where they're sitting in different parts of the home totally confused. But the University of Washington did some interesting observations. So first of all, they noticed that these 2,000 couples for 20 years, that 85% of those during a marital conflict who eventually withdrew and stonewall, that's the way they title it, withdraw and stonewall, withdraw and stonewall, was the man. 85%. That's what we call statistically significant. That's not chance. It's not a result of randomness. If you could put your money in an account that was 85% assured of making money, you're going to do it. And so the point is that is very significant. Now the question is, how do you interpret that? Well, why were these men withdrawing? Well, because they're egotistical, because they're unloving. And that was the descriptor. It was such a common response on the part of the female that they used the descriptor, what do you as a wife feel when your husband withdraws in Stonewalls? It feels like an act of hostility. And so they actually created a descriptor, act of hostility. It's an act of hostility. She could not imagine shutting down and withdrawing over what she perceived to be a minor criticism at best. What? Oh, come on. Because <laughs> the guy would deflate and withdraw. And she passed judgment on him. He's hostile. And with the way she then ultimately, he hates me. Because she could not imagine doing that. Two people who love each other don't do that. So for him to do that, he doesn't love me. Not at this point in time. And I need to point that out to him. This feels hateful. You're not loving me. And then you say it in a way that's disrespectful. Now you've got an interesting dynamic going on here. Because he's not hearing the deeper cry of your heart. He's taking up offense over the delivery. And then you talk about two people who think, we made a mistake. No, you're actually kind of normal. But the men... Why were these men withdrawing? Well, remember, as I said today, they, they were measuring the BPMs, the beats per minute of the heart. And during these conflicted moments, the men's heartbeats got to 99 beats per minute. That's warrior mode. So when a man is in that kind of state, he has to calm down. And he knows if he continues to have this face-to-face 
heated fellowship, it's going to escalate. And he doesn't want it to escalate because men know physiologically they can lose that, so they have to withdraw because that's honorable. Among us as men, the honor code dominates. So when we're in heated moments with our best buddy, we drop it, forget it, and we exit because the relationship exceeds this issue on the table. You are more important to me than this topic. And when we have that moment, my best friend doesn't go, Emerson, you come back and talk to me. (laughs) He's not in my face because he's not insecure about this. But when a woman is insecure and that disconnect happens, it's threatening at the core of her being. It's just like she is frightened. She's three conversations away from her perception, this thing of him walking out on her. And so she's continually needing reassurance that they're connected and everything's okay between them. So she gets very aggressive in the home to connect. So it raises the question, when a man stonewalls and withdraws, is it an act of hostility or is it an act of honor? The answer is yes. It just depends on whether you videotape in blue or videotape in pink, which is the word picture I use because it captures this point very well. So we point out pink and blue together, purple, the color of royalty, the color of God. Jesus said, have you not read? He who made them from the beginning made them male and female. I see her as pink and blue, so to speak. Together they are purple. They reflect the image of God. God's not pink, not God, not blue in that sense. He's purple and we together reflect his image. And so if you videotape this in blue, it's an act of honor. If you videotape that episode in pink, it's an act of hostility. And what happens in relationship, if I know I'm right, then my spouse has to be Rather than having this mature perspective, neither one of us are wrong, we're just different. That this is not a moral issue that we're talking about. These are what I call the pink and blue differences in the gray areas of life that must not be escalated to black and white matters. It's just a common issue. There's not moral issues here. If there are, then I'm, that's not my frame of reference. He's betraying you. He's beating the kid. We're not talking about that. We're talking about these day in and day out tensions between people of goodwill. And so here you have this moment where I know I'm right, and therefore my spouse has to be wrong. No, my idea is better, their idea is less better. The way in which they're dealing with this is less better in my opinion, but that doesn't make it bad. How can you say a man is hateful when he's trying to do the honorable thing? This is why he doesn't apologize to you. Why should he say he's sorry for doing the honorable thing on the heels of what he perceives to be disrespect from you over something that he didn't feel was unloving? And then we label him egotistical and arrogant because he never says he's sorry. You don't say you're sorry in the man's world for doing the honorable thing when you want to just really go after your best buddy. Why would you apologize for that? But the culture of... Of, of intimacy is pink in this culture. So it dominates. And the females are telling us why men do what they do. They're defining who men are. And a lot of that can be very accurate. But we got to be very guarded if you don't have men in there also saying, let me tell you what's really going on. Just as what would you think if all of us men were telling you women what you feel and why you feel it? I mean, we've got to be gracious and merciful here. But the point is, neither one of you wrong. Now, it's important that you not use this you go, so, so here's the deal. It's, I don't justify you gentlemen now just walking on, doing the honorable thing. I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> no, no, it's not the application here. I need 15 minutes to calm down. My heartbeats are 99 beats, and I need to get them down right around 65. <laughs> and then in 15 minutes, I'll come back. Don't chase me. <laughs> and then you, as a man of integrity, man of honor, come back for 15 minutes and talk about it for 15 minutes, but you don't, not 15 hours, lady. Keep it on one point. He's going to stay in place. You stay on one point. And in my book, I talk about rules of engagement. So get the book, Love and Respect, because I don't have time to get into that. But here's the point. You don't use this information to club your spouse. You don't say, you're not an honorable man. It is hostile. Women rule. Women are right. No, I'm telling you, if your sweet daughter-in-law does that toward your precious baby boy, hmm, he's a good kid, but he's going to shut down because physiologically as a male, this is what's going to happen. She's going to say he's hateful. Maybe he's honorable. Now, it doesn't justify staying away. The point is, as an honorable man, you come back. But if we both label the other, you're wrong for feeling, well, you're wrong. You're going to just be, you're not going to get anywhere with this information. 
What you both have to say, neither one of us are wrong, we're just different. And I'm trying to do the honorable thing, but I can, I can understand why that feels hateful to you. I don't hate you. I kind of think you don't like me. I'm trying to just, you know, I, so we need to somehow figure this out. Well, I'm not trying to dishonor you in this. I'm feeling insecure and I need reassurance that you love me because I need your strength and it's actually a compliment, not a complaint. I hope you understand that. Well, it's not easy. That's the way you would have done it when you were first meeting. Courtship, you know how to do these things. You have the skill and knowledge, but we get to a point where we get annoyed with each other. And it keeps happening. We're dis, oh, come on, oh, oh, here we go again. Oh, oh, we didn't do that in courtship. Because we didn't think this would continue to happen. <laughs> so we were... <laughs> but the researchers also studied the women on the other side of the equation. And the other side of the equation is that they were... Uh, Criticizing, complaining, criticizing, complaining, criticizing, complaining, criticizing, complaining, criticizing, complaining. I knew it wasn't politically correct, but that's the linguist. That's what it is. Criticism, complain, criticism, complain. So the men were asked, what do you feel when she criticizes and complains? It feels like an act of contempt. It feels like she's using this topic, send me a message, you can't stand who I am as a person. But we know from all the research, I have my uh, doctorate in family studies, all the scales on nurturing, caregiving, women are off the charts. You talk about the virtue of love and care. I know why she's moving toward him, because she cares. She criticizes because she cares. She criticizes not because she's trying to control, but because she cares. So it raises the question, is it an act of contempt or an act of care? Yes. It just depends on whether you videotape in pink or blue. Well, I saw a pink and blue verse in Ephesians 5.33 that's very important because I, I find this fascinating that not only do the researchers find that love and respect are the two key ingredients, but it's gender specific. She leans toward the love side. He leans toward the respect side. Ephesians 5.33, 2,000 years ago, the Lord said the same thing. Each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Hmm. Now, today I talked a little bit about respect and the, the, the pushback on that. Our time is elapsing right now, so I don't have time to unpack what I said this morning because it would be redundant. This is a second message. Some of it's contingent on what I said this morning. So those of you here for the first time tonight, I apologize. But there's real pushback on the respect side. I don't feel any respect for him. He's not superior to me. I'm not inferior to him. You know, I'm not going to give him license to do what he wants to do. I think this is a return to male patriarchy. There's a mantra that I go through that explains how women react. It's what I call the landmines, and I've stood on every one of them. It explodes in your face because men serve and die for honor, but when women hear respect toward a man, gag me. But the point is, your husband is extremely vulnerable to what he perceives to be your contempt or disdain or disgust or disrespect toward his spirit. We're not talking about respecting bad behavior. In our world as men who have the honor code, we never honor or respect bad behavior. We honor the man who has acted dishonorably. We always, like Jesus, your spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak. We never show contempt toward the spirit. If you show contempt toward the spirit, you've got an enemy. We're very guarded. We believe in the man. Well, I'm saying, I believe in you more than you believe in yourself, Harry. I think I've always admired you more than you admire yourself. You've got a real problem with your self-image right now. That behavior there is out is unbecoming of who I see you to be. Doggone it. I mean, he's going to be drinking that in. He's not going to like it. But you talk about honoring a man while you're slapping his rear end. I mean, it's, it's just the way we approach. Great male leaders do this. They never show contempt toward the spirit of the man any more than you can show hate toward the spirit of your wife. You cannot come across in this harsh, angry way, and you say, oh, she's not teachable about money. Well, you're, no, you're killing her with your spirit toward her spirit. And what happens, it gives birth to what I call the crazy cycle. Without love, this is the problem, she reacts, though, without respect, because <laughs> she's threatened. She's not trying to be disrespectful. And without respect, he ends up reacting in a way that feels unloving to her. And this gets crazy. Without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, he reacts without love. And in the book, Love and Respect, I unpack the crazy cycle and how we get off the crazy cycle. But I shared with the group that there's something that Sarah and I, we get on the crazy cycle every week, a couple times every month. It's not a big thing, but we know how to jump off. But how do we jump off? And I want to conclude with this. As you get into this Ephesians passage, this was first written on parchment. We put chapter and verse later so the Christian community could quickly reference. But Paul's writing on parchment. And there's this theme. Chapters 1, 2, 3 is doctrine that we've now made. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 is application. 
And he swings from doctrine to application on the husband-wife relationship, father-child relationship, master-slave. And then he does the same thing in Colossians. One and two doctrine, three and four is application. He swings from father, excuse me, husband-wife, uh, uh, father-child, and master-slave. And you'll see in other epistles, sometimes they'll throw in a fourth, authority and citizen. Why those four areas? That's where the Lord's watching. It has nothing to do with talent has nothing to do with symmetry, has nothing to do with celebrity, has nothing to do with spiritual giftedness, has everything to do with trust in Christ, love for Christ, trust and obedience toward Christ. And Paul goes on in that Ephesians 6 saying, and he keeps using this refrain, as to the Lord, as to the Lord, as to the Lord. You husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. You wives, uh, hupotasso toward your husband as to the Lord. He's not the Lord, you're doing it as the Lord. Why? Because Jesus said, as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. And he hits this theme again and again in both Colossians as well as in Ephesians, as to the Lord. He goes from the vertical or the horizontal to the vertical. He just goes into the heavenlies. And then he says at the, in that in the section, whatever good thing each one does, this he'll receive back from the Lord. New International says we'll be rewarded. Now those of us in Christ, in Christ in us, salvation is a free gift. Jesus Christ paid the penalty. I wasn't raised in a Christian home, and once I realized that he's the substitutionary atonement for all my sin, this is a gift that he gives to us. You can't buy the gift, you can't earn the gift. Salvation and heaven is a free gift, but it's like the Lord is saying, there's an add-on. Once you're in heaven is a free gift that I paid for, that you could be there. I want to respond to people who trusted and obeyed me. I want to respond to the people who loved and reverenced me. I want to be able to say, boy." Add a girl. Why do Sarah and I try to get off the crazy cycle? Because at the end of the day, the Lord says, Emerson, I want you to love Sarah because I'm standing beyond her shoulder. You love me, Emerson. Emerson, Emerson, I see her. She's got your book up in your, her fa- your face again. I see it. I see it. Oh, no, I, oh, wow, I heard what she said. Emerson, don't walk away. Emerson, no, she's, not, she's insecure right now. Emerson, unto me. Attaboy. Yes. Oh, wonderful. You said you're sorry. It's been a long time. Wonderful. <laughs> Oh, you even asked her to forgive you. Wow. Unto Christ. Sarah, Sarah, unto me. Uh, no, I see Emerson ignoring you. No, I know he's using the excuse that he's tired. No, I see. Oh, beautiful move. Hand over your mouth, Sarah. Beautiful move. Oh, two, a two for two hands. Oh. But what I want you to envision is you've got to see Jesus Christ beyond the shoulder of your spouse. Uh, Sam Mosier, who was up in Nickelodeon, said to me, My marriage is about Christ in me. I never even thought about that before. I never connected my marriage to Christ. Is anybody reading Ephesians and Colossians? It's all about that. Your spouse affords you the opportunity to hear well done from Jesus Christ. In fact, you can do marriage God's way even if your spouse bails on you. You can be a loving man in the face of a woman who is disrespectful and not lovable, and you are touching the heart of Christ. The question is, do you believe this? I don't think we have a crisis of marriage in the church. I think we have a crisis of faith. I don't think we really believe it's going down the way I'm saying. My question to you is, can you put on love toward Christ who stands beyond the shoulder of your spouse? Ultimately, I'm called upon to love Jesus Christ, and Sarah walks in between Jesus and me, and my love for Christ should spill over onto Sarah's love for her. So if I'm not loving Sarah, it means I'm not loving Christ. Christ calls Sarah to reverence him, and periodically I walk in between Jesus and Sarah, and her reverence for Christ should spill over onto me as respect for me. And so if she's not respecting me, is she reverencing Christ? If I'm not loving Sarah, am I loving Christ? From a biblical standpoint, the answer to that is no. And there's coming a moment when I stand before the Lord, I die and I sin. Emerson, did you love Sarah? Lord, you, do you realize the family of origin? Do you realize the issue? Emerson, Yes, sir. Did you do this out of trust and obedience toward me? Did you do this out of love and reverence toward me? This is my command to you. Sarah's irrelevant here. She has nothing to do with this. Sarah, did you respect their... Uh, Lord, since I've died, he's now making a poster of himself as the love and respect poster child. Sarah, Emerson's irrelevant. In more ways than one. I can't believe he's done that. Michael, deal with Emerson down here. (laughs) But Sarah, did you do this out of love and reverence toward me, out of trust and obedience toward me? Has nothing to do with Emerson. That's what this text, these are imperatives. And they have nothing to do. This is, God calls me to be loving. Sarah's irrelevant. What's the incentive? Why would I get off the crazy cycle? When we start spinning them, without love, she reacts. Why would I jump off of this thing? Because at the end of the day, Christ is present. Do I fail? All the time. Proverbs 24, 9, 24, 16 says, a righteous man falls seven times. 
but arises again. You've got to get up. You can't be defeated by defeat. You've got to get back up. And here's one of the reasons why. Sadducees you know, and the Pharisees were two groups. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And they gave this story about the seven sons, all of them died, and then she died. And in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Well, it was a trick question because they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. But Jesus said, you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. You're not married in heaven nor will be given in marriage in heaven, but you'll be like angels. What's Jesus saying? You're not going to be married to this person in heaven. So what is marriage all about? It is a tool and a test to deepen and demonstrate our love and our reverence for Jesus Christ. And your spouse affords you that opportunity. The question is this, have you gotten this? Or are you spinning on the crazy cycle incessantly because you're blaming them for your unloving I'm not obeying you, Jesus Christ, because this woman is dissing me, and I can't obey. There needs to be a footnote that I'm an exception. In the Greek, I think it's there. (laughs) Parchment, hey, Harry in 2020 is an exception. You ain't going to find it. But here's what I believe. It's coming this moment. You stand before the Lord and he says, well done. You did this. You got it. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You are faithful in a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. Really, Lord? Yes. (gasps) I call it the unending first moment. And that will go on forever and ever and ever. And even that pales in comparison to what we're going to experience. Because eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It has not entered the heart of man what he's prepared for those who love him. He will do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can think or ask. Paul said in Ephesians 3. Some of you have no idea what's coming. Because the Lord does not want you to know. And it all hangs on where he's watching first and foremost. When he swings from doctrine to application. The husband-wife relationship. That's what he's watching because that's what's important to him. And what is foolish in the world is the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is the foolishness of the world. The world said it's foolish to put on love toward a disrespectful woman. It's foolish to put on respect toward an unloving man. Not talking about being in harm's way, you get out of harm's way. Talking about two good-willed people who don't like each other because they've been spinning on the crazy cycle. And the world would say, if you do that, you're a fool. And God says, you are the epitome of wisdom to me. And I am going to reward you throughout eternity. Let's pray together. Lord, you know our hearts. You know that we're inadequate and that we fall short. But we caught a bigger vision that marriage is a tool and a test to deepen and demonstrate our love and reverence for you. And maybe there's someone here tonight who is a husband and wife or who wants just prayer because they want to come forward not because there's something wrong but because your spirit is calling them to a deeper deeper commitment to you and they're coming forward as a declaration we want to do it even better we want to do it right and Lord we are honored by their willingness to make that decision tonight thank you for their example to us but again we want to be those who trust your word follow your word and how to jump off the crazy cycle because at the end of the day it's not about the person standing in front of me it's about Jesus Christ beyond the shoulder of my spouse who one day will say, well done, well done, well done. Hey, thanks for watching. To find out more about Houston's First, you can subscribe to our channel or you can go to houstonsfirst.org.